welcome to the MMA Fan Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Stu and Blake. John Hathaway, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. How are you, mate? Very well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for having me on. Absolute pleasure, absolute pleasure. Well, there's so much to talk about, and and obviously during this this chat we're going to ask where the bloody hell you've been, um, but. We always like to sort of start these conversations right back where it started. So we want to ask you, John, like how you found yourself getting involved in the world of mixed martial arts and where the story began. Uh, I guess for me, again, I, I, was, I was kind of, I guess, an avid competitor growing up. I always played rugby. I had like two older brothers. So I was kind of, I guess, used to a bit of a rough and tumble, so to say. But um, for me, I remember just watching one of the, uh, I think it was, like a UFC unleashed on a on a Sky Sports program one night and just kind of fell in love with it from there. And I, I think I must have been about 14, 15 at that point. Yeah. Obviously it was a it was a nightmare to kind of it wasn't like the internet wasn't the same as what it is nowadays. You you couldn't yeah. really watch any of it. So I mean I remember picking up some VHSs and some um I think some DVDs at that point that probably started coming in a bit more of like the old UFCs and I guess starting from the beginning of it, watching, you know, Dan Seven and, and Hoist Gracie and Ken Shamrock and stuff. And um, where did you grow up, John? Uh, I always grew up uh, down Brighton and Hoveway, so I was always a yeah. kind of southern boy. I, I always tend to ask a lot of people, like, is is that a place where you dealt with a lot of like confrontation growing up? But in my head, maybe I'm wrong. I don't imagine Brighton being. I imagine Brighton being quite a lovely place. Like me and my wife travel down to Brighton every now and again. I mean, I know times change. Like I, I grew up in Peckham, which was a rough place to grow up. Right. But now everyone's moving to Peckham. Everyone yeah. seems to think Peckham's like the cool hotspot in London. So things change. How was Brighton growing up for you? 20 years ago or whatever yeah absolutely fine i said I, I generally avoided any confrontation stuff they always had like i guess in any area you know some are obviously more rough than others but you always had some bad guys but just generally i didn't hang out of them wasn't really involved with the kind of bad crowd or anything like that so i mean i've never had any fights outside competition really and what what did you start with in terms of your martial arts journey what where did you go was it was it kickboxing was it jujitsu how did you what, what was the first martial art you you took up uh, I mean, I guess I started all by myself. I, mean, I think I picked up, was it probably like a, a local black belt magazine from like some Kung Fu shop, ordered some uh, VHSs again. I ordered um, Bass Ruins like Pan, Extreme Pancrase and I ordered Mark Kerr's um, Wrestling for Valley to Do and then just started watching that, wrestling with my friends, wrestling with my brothers. Obviously, we had stops and starts with that, like where we got all the pads didn't get groin guards, started sparring, everything was going fine. Obviously, someone gets dropped with a kick to the groin. <laughs> Obviously, sparring gets, you know, cooled off for like a month until we can get some money, get some groin guards, and then start back up again. But I mean, yeah, it was just, um, there I mean, wasn't really places. I was going to say, John, is this all happening in like your parents' front room? Pretty much, like in the front room, in the garden. <laughs> and like I mean, I, I, was, I was doing it at school. I was kind of... Getting, getting all my friends involved, really. I mean, I mean, I had a bunch of rugby friends, so I mean, they were all fine and, and up for it. Yeah. You know, I can tell you, every, every one of my rugby friends, I mean, obviously there's over 15 of them in a team. Every one of them wrestled, knew how to do like a basic Kimura, armbar, triangle. Everyone had to, basically. Otherwise, they were just going to get wrestled at some point by me. And, oh. <laughs> you know, they needed to know something out of this. Otherwise, it's just going to be a bad, bad day for them, really. That's amazing. That's that. That's just that's a different time, isn't it? Like where we right. are now, all all the fighters that are like you know under thirty and all that kind of stuff, they're all coming up and they're doing martial arts, if not MMA classes. Right. You know that that's that's where it is. It's, it all it begins now with MMA, doesn't it? You were just ordering videos. You didn't have a class. You were just doing it in your front that's room a, with your mates. There, it's a different time. Uh, there wasn't really classes. It was crazy. I remember actually in like. I guess my last year of school, we obviously we had internet on the on the in our IT classes, and I'll just try to spend time like looking up techniques on like BJJ.org. But like, there wasn't any videos or anything. It's not like YouTube is nowadays. You can look at any technique you want to nowadays. But when I was looking at like still frame pictures, and I remember always always want to remind me because it's how I learned a clock choke was a uh, is the Wallet Ismail versus uh, Hoist Gracie match. And after that happened, they did like a breakdown on it, and it was just like. Trying to load up took forever. Obviously, it took like basically the whole class just to to read and look at these pictures for one technique. You know, like obviously during this is during trying to actually get you know the teacher to make me do work as well. So mm. yeah, just having a page up and just trying to trying to read stuff and learn about it. So the point where like 
your parents must have been like, seriously, John, like you've got to stop fighting with your brothers in the front room. When did it evolve into finding a gym? And, and what was that first discipline you, you, you joined the gym to, to, to pursue? So uh, for me, I think we were about, I'd say about 17, and we started going over to a Seoul Gilbert CT fight school. So Seoul was a, a local fighter who trained up at, at London Shoot Fighters, is how I kind of got my connection with Shoot Fighters. And he was down from the Brighton area. And he had a gym in like Peace Haven way. So we used to get out to him basically and start training him. And again, it was fully trained under, I guess, mixed martial arts. Obviously, Jack McGee run the uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu down there. And kind of there's some other individual ones. But pretty much, again, I tackled it. I was probably one of the first generations to, to tackle MMA as like a whole thing rather than coming from a, a discipline of an, another discipline, basically. I mean... All disciplines are obviously ridiculously difficult to, to 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 you know to excel and certainly to reach the level that you, you you reached. How easy did it come to you? You know, you said you competed at a rugby to a decent level. Like moving into mixed martial arts, did did you feel instantly comfortable with it, and did it come relatively comfortably to you? Yeah, I mean, I guess probably the, the one that took the longest to kind of get comfortable with was, was the stand-up. I was always fine with with the grappling and the ground and pound side or, or the actual kind of like the takedown wrestling side. But just getting used to, I guess, getting hit in the range of stand-up took a little while. But I said it was something I knew I wanted to do so much that I wasn't going to let that stop or slow me, if that makes sense. You had uh, a successful run in in like cage rage. This is yeah. what, how far back we're going now. So like cage, not cage warriors, cage rage. As and, I was in the early uh, days of stuff. So that's it. Yeah, it was the early days, and uh, and then you ended up getting into UFC. I think it was two thousand and nine. You yeah. made your debut. You made your debut in two thousand. That's you know twelve years ago. You made your debut in the UFC. You must have seen some huge changes, both with the sport of MMA, the UFC in particular, obviously the UK MMA scene. What's the things that have really stood out to you over the course of like 12 years of, of, from that debut to this point now? What's the things that have really leapt out to you as like huge changes you've seen in, in, in the mixed martial arts world? Well, I, I guess, you know, the general level of just everyone's mixed martial arts has, has gone up. But what you find is that, I mean, the biggest difference is I remember UFC cards, like when I first started, I guess, competing on UFC or even before that, I remember, you know, once a month you'd have a UFC card. It'd be one of them things, or maybe not even once a month, and maybe even longer than that. You'd get all your friends around, you'd stay up, it'd be that kind of like big event rather than now they're on every week. It's so hard. Like everyone pretty much I know watches them on a Sunday. Do you know what I mean? Sunday morning, they get <laughs> yeah. up, yeah. they find somewhere to watch and stuff because it's just too much rather than like, what if, it's not that it's lost a special occasion because it, they just have so many more fighters they need to put out. And it's the best thing about it. It's not just UFC. There's so many good shows and organizations, whether they're UK based, obviously Octagon being a, a European based one's massive, like KSW. There's so many good, big organizations around putting out amazing fight cards every, almost every week. I imagine there's one on every week. Yeah. yeah. You know I mean, somewhere in the world, and which well, is like said, a high level thing. Yeah. And multiple organizations as well right. as you're saying. You've got Bellator, PFL, UFC, Cage Warriors. There's so much going on. It's, it's hard to keep up with it all, isn't it? Right. Yeah, so that, it was that weird thing of like, I guess when I started, you'd never always be able to do this now. You'd know a couple of fighters, but I remember probably when I started in UFC or before, I almost knew like every UFC fighter. But again, they've added like two new weight classes. I think they only had lightweight to heavyweight at that point. Each division didn't have like hundreds of people. They probably had like 30 people in each one. Do you know what I mean? So you almost knew like every yeah. fighter. But now, yeah, it's just a, just a plethora of people in every, every division. We, we like to sort of dig into the sort of mental aspect of the fight game on this podcast, which we, we, we'll do throughout this episode. But just going back to, yeah, no, not necessarily even your UFC debut, your, your first fight. And tell me what was going on in your head before you made that walk to the octagon. Uh, I mean, probably not much. I like, I just kind of go over all the stuff that I need to do and I go, I guess I always have like one last thought before I, I, I walk out. So that basically I always have this thing of like, all right, so I've, I've made it. It's basically happening. Cause it's always that thing of like, you know, in the weeks building up to it, you could trip over something, you could injure yourself, you could do anything that will, will somehow stop you from fighting. So I always have that last thought before you walk out there. It's like, okay, this is actually happening. You just got to go out there and, and do what you do. Okay. Um, you, you were 14 and 0 when you ended up. I mean, you 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 got into the UFC, and I think you're on a 
four fight win streak and you beat people like Diego Sanchez, you beat Rick Story, like you, the, the guys that were top, top names at the time. I mean, young fans of the sport coming in now won't look at necessarily Diego Sanchez in the way you would look at him if you saw him fighting back when yeah, you back were fighting him, different. you know. It was a very, very different kettle of fish. To have wins over Rick Story and, and, and Diego Sanchez, that was a big deal back then. And you were on a four-fight win streak, and then you 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 fought Mike Pyle and, and, and had your, your first loss. How difficult was that to overcome that? Because I think on this show, I always like to kind of hear fighters talking about the methods that they use to kind of overcome difficult times or overcome adversity because i think listeners can hopefully try and apply certain things to their own lives and how difficult was it for you because you must have felt invincible you're 14 and 0 you've had a four fight win streak in the ufc and then and then you have to suffer defeat for the first time was that a difficult pill to swallow and how did you overcome it if it was maybe it wasn't difficult for you uh i guess i mean during it obviously it's darn difficult because it was like one of the nights where like it was almost that nightmare night where like I was almost just a step behind for every round. It was three rounds of just getting beat up. And you're just like, wow, this is a, just can't seem to go right, basically. And I, I mean, after you just kind of like, okay, like that happened. I mean, there's, there's nothing you can do about it. Kind of, it's, it's happened. Yeah. So you just got to kind of get back in, start getting back into the routine of everything and then get back out and try to perform. So you found it quite easy to kind of like compartmentalize it slightly and just kind of go, you know, that's just something that's happened. We now move on to the next one. Yeah. That was a blip. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. It's like, yeah, just right. Cool. I mean, super annoying. I wish it never happened, but it happens. And you just got to kind of carry on, really. I'm really interested in what, what, what you said there when you said, like, you know, you felt like a kind of step behind what was going on. And, and you know, you realised at this point that, you know, there's you're probably not going to get the W in this fight. Like, what what is the kind of thought process, like, when that sort of, negativity kicks in of like oh shit this 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 isn't going very well i, I you know what, what where do you go with your your mindset there do you just look to your coaches for advice like what what's the kind of process if you like for instance i don't know two rounds down it's like right you, you probably got to get the sort of stoppage to, to get the win like what what's the kind of what's going on in your head and how much of what your coaches are saying to you in the corner at that point will actually manifest itself I mean, ideally, you'd love everything to manifest for the coaches say, because then you've already got the win. Like, so like, you're like, yeah, all right, I'm, I'm two rounds down. I was like, you know, they tell you, you know, we need to do this, need to do this, change this stuff. And you're like, okay, I'll, basically, all you can think of is I will try to do that the best I can, you know? Yeah. And ideally, you know, I'd get the finish and we'd, we'd kind of, it'd be over. So, yeah, I mean, I guess to a certain extent, you can look at uh, the Leon Edwards latest fight. Because it oh, does absolutely. happen. Absolutely. You know, it does happen. And bless him, like, he, I'm super happy for him. He won that, won the first round, obviously lost up until that last round. You know, it was kind of almost, you, most people would probably say it was in the bag at that point. But, yeah, you know, you can still pull out. So, yeah, you just keep trying to basically do what either your coaches ask for or what you've, you've been training to do. Yeah. Yeah. So after, after the mic, pile fight you go on another three fight win streak in the ufc everything feels like it's going really well you then unfortunately uh lose to don hyun kim but that was back in 2014 and you haven't had a fight since now we we know what but Stu and i have obviously done a little bit of research we know a little bit what's going on but for all the listeners out there that aren't familiar with the john hathaway story and, and what went on can you now kind of explain to them, to us, what's happened so that you've been out of the cage for, for eight years? Yeah, for sure. I mean, for me, basically, I, I'd already had before the Kim fight. I think it was after the Powell fight I got it. But I basically got uh, ulcerous colitis, which is basically a kind of form of Crohn's in the large bowel. And I'd had to pull out, I want to say by the end, before I kind of, I guess, not retired, but stopped competing. I think I pulled out of three fights and it just kind of rankled me a bit happened to do that and I mean even with the, the Kim fight I was kind of I had to go on um the Prodisone which is the medication to kind of like stop flare-ups before it but I mean it just was annoying me to have to pull out of the fight I think it was I would say Matt Brown was the first one which was really annoying because that would have been a, a great match as well and he's like mm. kind of one of the old hands yeah it would have been great to compete against him obviously the last one was um Gunnar Nelson as well and again would have been great competitions and the worst thing about it was I think most times you know 
kind of a, a flare up kind of comes when your body is under a lot of stress and it'd be in those last couple of weeks. And it was just a terrible thing to have to pull out on someone because he's been training just as hard as me mm. with like two weeks left, three weeks left. And well, maybe they'll find a, a replacement, but maybe they won't, you know? What so kind of was just thing. In towel, John. Sorry, what, is, what, are, like, for, for, what are the symptoms of, of, of um, I, you say it's not Crohn's, it's uh, ulcerous. Ulcerous, like, but again, yeah. the, the, the things will be very similar on the symptoms. It would obviously be a, a large amount of abdominal pain, uh, discomfort, fatigue, and just basically feeling really run down and rough because you're fighting something internally, basically, which obviously kind of goes completely against <laughs> trying to fight and uh, and train to a hard degree, you know, especially as well when you're coming into those last weeks where you almost need as much as you want. You'll never be perfect for a match, but you want most things to go as perfect as they kind of can in those last yeah. couple of weeks. And I mean, how was that with dealing with things like weight cutting? Was that e extra difficult for weight cuts? Because again, you're talking about being fatigued. Well, whenever you're cutting weight, you're going to be fatiguing already. You're going to be dehydrating yourself. How, how was it dealing with, with flare-ups, as you call it then? I guess to a certain extent, it's like I say, silver lining for it. It's almost the opposite, where it would help me lose loads of weight just because everything would just oh, really? pass straight through me and not, <laughs> not hold in. So like, it's almost the worst thing that I was like overcut, even weeks building out just because my body wouldn't hold on to anything. It would just be wow. kind of, I guess, burning so many calories, just fighting off infections internally. And uh, yeah, so I mean, I, I was light, <laughs> which is always good. I, I mean, to be fair, it's, it's incredibly impressive because I remember... I think it was before the Matt Brown one. I mean, I was running some of my best times. I was light. I, I was fit because I was in towards the end of a camp. You know, so I was doing some of my, my kind of best best two-miler runs and stuff like that, some good fitness things. So it's amazing what your body can kind of continue to do, you know? Yeah. Was, was there a kind of point sort of psychologically when you just thought, right, look, something's definitely not right here and it's going to impact at some point soon on my career but like, when did that kind of really present itself to you john i guess when i, I pulled out of the gunner one just because again it had been i don't know how many flowers i'd had at that point but i pulled out three fights do you know what i mean it was like okay like i'll take some time off after this and like just try to kind of go through and almost almost fix it do you know what i mean it's that hard thing with fixing it but i said i went for a couple of well a couple of different diets to start with then medications because the, the next set of medications up from what i was on was basically immune suppressants and the thought of going on like immune suppressants always kind of really rankled with me or didn't, yeah. didn't particularly want to do it because it seemed counterintuitive to what <laughs> what I should be doing with my body, basically. Yeah. But again, everything kind of takes ages to kind of like settle into like, oh, you know, you're trying to diet, whether it would, you know, a FODMAP diet, so a low uh, information diet and you try it, but then you try it for say three months, you're like, oh, it seems to be working, not had a flare up, everything's good. And then four months in, you'll have a flare up. Six months in, you have a flare up. So you're like, okay, so that doesn't work. Then you'll try another type of diet. That wouldn't work. And then say I moved on to the immune suppressants. And I think I went through, I want to say probably about four or five different versions of it. But I said each one's like takes about three to six months where you, you start taking it, you go in like every other week, have bloods done, see how the, the kind of body's reacting to them. I remember one of them just made me violently sick, so I got to stop that one immediately. One, basically, my body was changing into something different, so I had to take more medication to stop it changing into something different so my body could actually use what it's meant to be using to kind of suppress my immune system. Wow. So what what was the moment that – because I know that you – am I right in saying you ended up having three surgeries yeah. uh, overall to, to, to deal with this? But you you were at one point maybe adamant you didn't want to have the surgery. So what 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 was the turning point there? I, I guess I mean I was before going for this. I was adamant that I wasn't going to take immune suppressants. <laughs> so I'd, once once I'd kind of tackled that, hurdle, yeah. I was like, oh, okay, you know, we'll just crack on with that. And then uh, I went into like biologicals, which were actually pretty good. They are almost like they work a little bit like an immune suppressant, but not not in the same way, nor as I guess invasive on the body. But you would have like an IV for like an hour then wait an hour and then, and then go. And they would make me feel great for say, I think I'd have them every eight weeks and I'd feel great for like the first six to seven weeks. And then the last week I'd start feeling a bit like run down and a bit crummy again. Yeah. And that kind of kept me all right for a little while. And then again, they had a flare up during being, should be in like a good period yeah. of them. Yeah. But I mean, for the surgery point, I mean, I was in that hospital for like the last year before, probably the last like, six to eight months, I was in that hospital like every, every other week really. Oh, God. I mean, it was right. Was that, was that pre-surgery or was that, that during was, the that surgery? That was pre-surgery, yeah, pre-surgery. Pre-surgery. 
And that's just because the flare-ups were so bad and so often that you just had to keep going to the hospital. Yeah, so basically... Jesus. You'd go on a prednisone, which is like the immu- immune suppressor, or like immune suppressor, the anti-inflammatory kind of steroid that helps control it. And normally, say, they'd give you eight pills, and every week you'd drop it down by one pill. But the problem is when I'd get to like seven pills, I'd flare up again. So then I'd go back into the hospital. I'd go on like IVs for like five days. Then they'd let me back out, and I'd go back on the oral pills. Then two weeks into the oral pills, I'd flare back up again, so I'd come back in. So I basically spent, I think, the last eight months before the surgery is on like prednisone, which is like quite it's quite a rough kind of thing. Again, it kind of helps, doesn't help anything really. It doesn't make your body feel great. Jesus. And, and during all of this time, what's the relationship been between yourself and the UFC? Again, when I kind of like took the step back, they just kind of was like, cool, just let us know when, when you want back in and we'll kind of go from there. So they've just been quite hands off with me, quite nice to just let it go. Obviously, I've been drug tested all throughout it. So, which I was, I was happy to do. So, How, I mean, they've quite good. So, you saw are, are still testing you regular? Yeah. And have done throughout? Yeah, at least three to four times a year I get wow. tested. Wow. How that must have been difficult if you were like, guys, I'm, I'm in the hospital. <laughs> you yeah. got to come here and do my. <laughs> like, there's loads of urine samples, guys. You just pop yeah. to the hospital and grab one. Like, but how, <laughs> that must have been. Was, was that not an, a, an extra burden? To, to, to have to no, notify your cider of your whereabouts all the time. I mean, granted, you were probably just at home at the hospital anyway. Yeah, they they never uh, clocked it, me, I guess, when I was in the hospital. But again, when I was back, they, they clocked me. It's yeah. like, I guess the annoying thing about it was remembering all the, the, the medications I was on throughout, like when I was doing the amuse rest yeah. and everything. I was just like, okay. You've you got to label that and send, <laughs> yeah. send that off, say, I'm on all this. Yeah. Jesus. Because there's so, like, prednisone is a funny one with the, the, the normal steroid what you're in when you're in a flare up. So it wasn't necessarily. See all the weird name stuff on the immune suppressants and the biologicals, which I'd have to kind of make sure I had written down in my phone somewhere. But the prednisone, funny enough, is it's fine out of competition, but it's it's a legal substance in competition. So it's like one of the ones where, like, I mean, I always put it down, being like, oh, I'm on prednisone at the moment, or these last couple yeah. months I'm on prednisone. So I'd always just kind of like after the first couple of times, but it'd be like a, a bit of a ball, like googling all this stuff and what I'm on. I was like, right, I'll just yeah. have it written down in my phone. So, so when yeah. they come in, I'm like, cool, this is what I'm on. Write it down. I said they were always, always again, it's like an external company that does the Asada testing over in this country, but they were always lovely guys. Yeah. So. And, and just sort of, you know, two, three, four years into this, what kept you, what kept you so positive and, 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 you know, did it always present itself to you that eventuality of this would be, I'll be back in the octagon and I will be competing? Uh, yeah, I mean, I always had that, that view. Obviously, I've, I've got a good wife, good family, good friends around me. I've had a little one now who's three and a half. So she's actually going to come around since the surgeries. But I mean, yeah, I always kind of had it in mind that I was going to compete again. Ideally, I mean, ideally, it would have taken a lot less longer, but it took, yeah. took a long time. So, And was you, I take it you was in and out of, of, of shoot fighters throughout this, this you know, yeah. sporadic. Whenever I could kind of get up, I'd, I'd, I'd kind of get up. Like, again, it was that weird thing where, like, you'd feel... You know, you'd be on medication for a couple of weeks. You'd start feeling like good. You'd start getting a little bit fit. You'd be like, cool, I can go back up. I can help some of the guys up there. They can help me out and kind of pick up, I guess, the, the new pace of MMA and stuff. Well, can I ask you, like, I, I suppose it's a slightly personal question, so you don't have to answer this at all. Sorry. But like, obviously, with like an eight-year hiatus from from fighting, that's that's how you earn your living. How, how have you been supporting yourself during that time? Uh, teaching mixed martial arts and grappling. So you've been I mean, you've been I, teaching, but yeah. I, and has that been? I just can, can imagine that being quite a difficult thing to do if you're, especially like around times of surgeries and stuff. Because I mean, how would the I'm, I'm I'm imagining quite big surgery when you're talking yeah. about something like this, but yet you're still kind of teaching from the sidelines or whatever it is. You're still doing all those things. Yeah, I mean, I got really good at descriptive teaching. If that makes sense. <laughs> 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 To, well, because you read all those internet pages back in the day. Right, no exactly. one could describe like, right, like you. Can, you spent hours in down. IT doing it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I had as well, like, when I had, like, my, my stoma in my, in my stomach, which is, like, kind of um, a bit of your bowel sticking out, which has a pouch over it, which is kind of what you, you defecate into. I had, like, a little hard plastic shell that went over it, like a little kind of, like, I guess, uh, support that kind of kept it all in place. So even when I had my stoma, I could still kind of teach and grapple. And, I mean, I, I still sparred and did a lot of stuff even with that. 
Was that an exterior? Again, I'm sorry, again, sorry if no, it's sorry. getting too graphic. Is that an a stomach? Is that an exterior thing or is that something that's internal? Oh, no, no, it's external. It sticks out your it's stomach. It's external and you're yeah. sparring. Yeah. <laughs> I said, I, I, I had like a hard what? plastic cover over it. So I had a hard plastic cover and like, I guess, like a little belt that kind of kept that in place. Jesus, that sounds that sounds mental to me. But like, you just, just like, got to do it. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, there you go. I mean, that, that's so you you've got an ex, external external stoma, you call it, and and a hard shell. Is that like that's something that it it comes with? That's that's not like you you've decided to manufacture your own thing. So oh, no, can, it's, but... they, they 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 sell them. They do sell them. They, <laughs> they, sell them. they didn't come with it. They didn't give it to me at the hostel. It's not like they were like advising oh, me to do any of this at the hostel. The... Oh right. So okay. I brought this. I brought this so I could specifically do like some type of sport or. But that's mad combat, as well. Really. Like, mo most people be like, I'm not gonna do much, you know, because this is, you know, I, again, it maybe might feel uncomfortable or you feel uncomfortable about it. Just kind of from an emotional or mental point of view, some people might have those kind of, um, uh, you know, inhibitions in some way or something. And you're there going, no, I'm going to buy a plastic coating for it and I'm going to spar people with it. Yeah. <laughs> That's much, again, you just got to get on with it. That's the thing. Every sort of said, like the majority of the time where like it sticks onto your skin, so it's almost like a um, like a blister blaster kind of sticky thing. And every sort of obviously when it, you get hot and sweaty and stuff, it will sometimes like start coming away, but you can kind of obviously immediately smell it. And then I'd be like, okay, like, give me five minutes. I'll go clean it up, change the, the bag. So I got a new bag on. So it's again, stuck to it properly. So nothing's leaking out or coming out. And then you kind of get back to it. I find that fascinating. I don't know why I find that <laughs> so fascinating. That's madness. That, but that, again, that just showed that's the, the, the level of like dedication from, I think, just people that do what you do for a living. That's just, and as you say, that whole attitude of just, well, yeah, you just, you just get on with it and you just find, you find solutions for the problems. Yeah, you'll you'll that, find a way to get, in. get back to doing what you want to do. And I, I, I just find that incredibly impressive. And I think that's, that's something that's very um, special with people that do, that, that, that are mixed martial artists, really, that they're just finding solutions and cracking on and staying positive. And, right. and and keeping that kind of mindset with it what what what, what was the low point like because i'm saying you, you I'm, I'm putting this on you because you seem like a very positive guy you right. seem like someone that you say you just get on with it and you stay positive what were the, the if, if there were what what were the low points was was there any moments where you were like this this might be a bit too much for me or in terms of like trying to get your career back on track and all that um, I mean, for the positiveness, anyone can kind of be like that on, on that positiveness. They just need to kind of stick with it, have a, and have that kind of right, right mindset. Do you know what I mean? And want something bad enough to get back mm. to. For me, I guess the only low points I really had was um, one of the times after my first surgery, like, as I said, like my bowel like froze up and stopped. And I had about like four or five days of that where basically my bowel wasn't moving. Nothing could go in or out really. And that was just like horrific. Wow. So you, you know, can't so theoretically eat or anything? And what, no, no basically, I, I was full. Like, my body was full from the, the stoma site. So it was, it was all like I said. I had um, the surgery. I had a uh, epidural in where they gave kind of pregnant women. So I couldn't feel anything from my, like, chest down, basically. So I woke up from the surgery, felt amazing. Because, again, like, I like six pounds of bad necrotic flesh had been taken out of me. So I was like, I feel great. This is great. They're like, want you to start eating and drinking again. So you start eating and drinking again. And then I think like a day in, they took the epidural out. Basically, my body realized like stuff had been done to it. Yeah. But where I'd eaten for like a, a day or two and it like stuff had been passing through all fine. When it realized stuff has happened to it, it basically froze up. Wow. And then uh, that was just like the grimmest thing ever, basically. But there was a there was a night, I think again, like four days in, maybe five days in. It was during one of the night shifts. So like the main doctors aren't there. And again, like, as I said, I think on area, it was like, it was an odd time because it was just before Christmas. And basically the, the, the private, ho um, the private, not hotel, private uh, hospital was basically shut down. So there was like no one in there bar me by the end of it for like the last two days. Like half the, half the hospital had been shut off. So just like areas are just dark, shut off. And there's like little areas you can kind of walk or I'd be walking around trying to get stuff moved basically. And so it was like that scene from like 28 days later where he's just walking around the hospital just being like, in a in, in one of the hostel gowns, walking with like a little uh, 
IV drip thing and just like we're walking. I'm I'm shuffling. I'm not really walking at this point because I'm like I'm not death's door, but I feel just horrific. I remember like second to well, the, the night before it stopped being bad, I basically was like said to the doctor on call, is like a French nurse, just basically like like do anything. Like I'll happily have anything. Like nothing could be worse than this at the moment. So she was like, oh, we'll basically put something in to drain it out. So what she did, she got like a tube and she put it up my nose and into my stomach to start draining stuff out. And obviously while she's doing this, I'm being sick and stuff because I'm, I'm full up to the gills anyway, or like nothing's going down. So anything's sitting in my stomach. She starts draining stuff. Nothing really happens. I remember I had this down my, my neck for like 45 minutes before she came back. And uh, it's probably one of the worst nights of my life. And then in the morning, my actual surgeon came in and just went, oh, okay, like, she probably shouldn't have gone through the nose. She should have just gone straight through the stoma, went through the stoma, pulled out a load of stuff, and then my body just started kicking back in again. So it started working fine. Oh, I had to go through one one horrible night. I mean, a couple of horrible days, but then one horrible night of it. Jesus. And I tell you what, I would not have slept if I was in, like, a hospital that had, like, no one in it. I would totally be freaking out. My mind's, like way too paranoid i've watched too many like zombie movies and stuff yeah. like that. I it had that horrible movie. filter that's what I mean. yeah uh that would creep me the fuck out yeah let alone being another patient and seeing what's that ufc fight just wandering around them <laughs> <laughs> oh mate well look, on to more positive things now you're back you are you're fighting again in what less than two weeks now? Right. I think it's fifth, less than two weeks. Fifth, fifteenth of October 15th. in Frankfurt, but for Octagon MMA. Yep. So you're not you're not back with the UFC, but you are still contracted with the UFC. Is that right? Yeah. So the UFC basically wanted me to to get out and basically, I guess, test my level and, and start getting back into the swing of things. Obviously, that everyone, I mean, everyone in Octagon is actually a very high level as well. So it's not like <laughs> saying too much about being like, oh, fight a lower level and then kind yeah, of build yeah. yourself back up. Yeah. So, <laughs> It's almost not in that way, but again, they were kind of, didn't know how to match me in UFC wise before the kind of big roster they got. So they said, "Hey, take a couple of fights out. I've got a four fight contract with with Octagon, so I will just get start getting cracking through that." And basically, I mean, the cool thing of Octagon is when you check out, they got shows all the time as well. You know, I think they've got three, maybe four before the end of the year as well. So it's not right. like I'm I'm going to be stuck waiting on the sidelines for a long time. I, I can kind of get busy, and you know, I've wasted almost eight years. So let's go get back in and get doing stuff. And as, as your body sort of recovered, and I, I know that you said that you're technically cured now, is that right? Yeah, yep. Don't have, I guess, the infected areas. That's great. And 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 so as you you know your body has recovered, and and you know your training, and obviously to you know to be fight fit is is different level kind, different levels of fitness, you know, to to, to be achieved. As the as the, the physical side of your uh, training has kicked in, like tell me a little bit about the sort of the mental aspect of of kind of training at that level again and i know you said that you was you know in and out of, of shoot fight throughout your, your, your time away but you know when you're now pushing yourself because you know you've got a fight in two weeks time like sparring and things like that like what was the sort of mental aspect of of going well i've had this done to my body like was it ever a concern that one body shot could do this? And I know physically, I'm, 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 you know, you say that you're, you're where you should be, but just the mental aspect of thinking, you know, if I take that one shot, could that do that? Did Has that ever kind of filtered through into your, your sort of thought process? Uh, no, not really. Like, I guess, I mean, body shots are going to hurt regardless. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good point. Whether you've got no, <laughs> you know, a stoma, no stoma, normal body, or anything. There you go. I mean, like, shoot always, I guess, good for me. When, when I was going up, when I, I say wasn't back to 100%, they were always like fairly light on me, but obviously London shoot training is always, always good, hard level. Everyone in there's pretty much an absolute killer and fighting on some high, high level show, you know? So uh, I think being back into the mix with all the guys now, I'm, I'm kind of feeling prepared and on that level, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> you, this seems like hopefully the, the start of a, a second career for you almost in, yeah. in MMA. Flash forward a few years, whenever you decide to retire, how do you want this? What's the goal? What's the what? What's the if you, if you to look back on this second half of your career and think of it at, to yourself as a success? What what would you like to achieve in the next few years? I guess just have fights, enjoy them, and and get winning. You know, I mean, I I, I did MMA because I enjoyed it. I never did it to to earn plenty of money or be famous or anything like that. I just like competing. 
and it's MMA I picked to compete in. So just ideally keep fighting and keep enjoying it. You don't want to get too old and I, I can't continue anymore. I'll retire, but as long as I'm still enjoying it, that's the and, main thing. And so what can fight fans expect from a 2022 John Hathaway? Hopefully a, a good fight. That's all I'll be looking to put on, like a good show. Looking obviously to do the, everything what I used to do, box, wrestle, grapple, and then do it for 15 minutes if I have to. Ideally, it'll stop before that, but 15 minutes if I have to. Wonderful. Have you got an opponent booked yet? Uh, yes, I believe. Well, I'm waiting to actually sign the contract. I'll, I'll sign the contract before actually uh, okay, I guess, cool. saying right, anything, just right, in case anything closes, right. I guess. So. We'll, we'll, when we stop the recording, you can Sorry. tell us afterwards. <laughs> yeah. A little sign. Well, look, the, whilst you have been away, the British MMA scene in particular right. feels like it's completely exploded. Um, we've got... Bisping's become a champion. Now Leon Edwards has become a champion. We've got people like Tom Aspinall, unfortunately, obviously injured at the moment, but right. looked like he was on a tear in the heavyweight division. Arnold Allen as well. It look, feels like, I mean, I know he's got Calvin Cater coming up soon. If he wins that fight, surely he's fighting for the belt next. He would be on like okay. a 10-fight I mean, win streak or something. His Dan Hooker match has been great. Every match he's had has, has yeah. been a fantastic match, you know? So, yeah, yeah I mean... The cool thing is it's, it's now like a UK card. It's now not just like a couple UK fighters on. Yeah, It's UK fighters from start to finish. And it's mm -hmm. there's a guy at the end of it who's a UK card. Rather than like, you know, back in UK cards back in the day, I guess you'd have UK guys on it. But, you know, the main event would normally be like a foreign affair or something like that. Rather than now, it's yep. literally start to finish, UK guys, and all like relevant UK guys. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. we're talking about Arnold Leonard. He's a fight away from, from title potential, two fights away. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Same with Tom Aspen until he got injured. Like that was, he was right on the cusp of doing some good stuff, you know? Yeah. And again, I just can't wait to see it more. Absolutely. And I think we've also seen the sort of evolution of, like, the superstars as well. Like, obviously, back in the day, you know, you mentioned, like, Hoist and people like that. They were, they were stars at that time, but the world of MMA was far smaller. The scale of it now, post Connor has kind of mm -hmm. blown it up. And, and, and we've seen the UFC become something ridiculous and, and obviously MMA in general. And, and we're seeing even like with British fighters now, like, like Paddy Pimlet. Like Paddy Pimlet oh, yeah. is a legit superstar now. What, three fights into the UFC? And look at him. Right. It's, you know, but it's, three uh, great fights as well. It's not like yeah. Uh, yeah. Boy, he's, he's entertaining <laughs> as hell, you know? Wonderful, wonderful. Well, Look, John, we won't take up any more uh, uh, of your time. And uh, we just want to thank you ever so much for coming on. It's so exciting yeah. to see like thank John Hathaway's name on a fight card again. And we wish you all the best uh, on the 15th. And uh, and after that fight, we'll we'll hit you up and we'll love to have you back on to, uh, Please do. to It'll chat be a pleasure. about how to fight when. Lovely. Awesome. Thanks thank ever so much, much John. Cheers, guys. Cheers, mate.